below. Hello, uh, for those of y'all that don't know who I am, my name is Maximilian Bowen and I'm the summer intern here with 12th Street. And I'm so excited and privileged to be able to continue on our Philippian sermon tonight. Um, if you would, pray with me and then we'll dive into the word. Uh, Father, I wanna thank you for this day. Father, I thank you just for this opportunity that we have. Father, just to see where you're moving in the word, Father, through Paul and Paul's writing. Father, I pray that you will just be for those that you will be with those that are listening, Father, and watching. Father, you will work in their hearts, Father, that your will will be done. And Father, I pray for myself as I give this message, Father, that you will speak through me. And Father, I pray that you will just continue to have your hand over all things in this manner and others. Father, we thank you and we praise you and all these things in your Son's name. Amen. It was 48 degrees in Vienna, Austria on October 12th, 2019, just before 8 a.m., Iliad Kipchoge, a Kenyan marathon runner, is getting some last minute stretching in before attempting to go out and make history. A little backstory, for the past eight years, Iliad has been trying to perform a feat that was said to be almost humanly impossible. He was going out to break the two hour time mark for a marathon. Now. Iliad is no slouch of a runner whatsoever, and has been said to be the greatest marathon runner of the modern era. But he wanted more than just the title. Up till this point, Iliad had missed his mark by just over a minute in one race, and another by only 25 seconds. Iliad also holds the world record for the fastest time for a sanctioned marathon that he did in two hours, one minute, and 39 seconds while racing in Berlin in 2018. But that was different. This is different. Iliad states that just days before his run in Vienna that Berlin is running and breaking a world record, but Vienna is running and making history in this world. Quite a statement coming from the Kenyan. At 8.15 a.m., Iliad was off and running. Throughout the race, 40 different pace setters would transition in and out to keep Iliad on track and up to speed, helping their fellow runner achieve the unbelievable. Fast forward through the entire race to the final kilometer, number 41 of 42. 
Ilya is on target to achieve greatness. On the clock, he is set to beat the two hour mark by a whole 10 seconds. But then he starts to sprint. You can watch the video and Ilya storms past his pace setters and makes his way to the end at an incredible speed. As he approaches the gate, he begins to point and cheer with the crowd with the biggest smile on his face. And he crosses the line with a time of one hour, 59 minutes and 40 seconds. A superhuman feat by a man who was just a humble farmer and elder at Kenya. And just like Iliad, we too as Christians have a race set before us that may seem impossible at times. I know that for multiple times I've seen it as an impossible feat. But here in Paul's message to the Philippians, he uses an intense running analogy to describe the Christian life, telling us of the pursuit of Jesus. And Paul is writing the Philippians of this pursuit, passionately expressing the consuming desire to know Jesus and that he is still running hard, but also that he still has a ways to go. So if you guys will, we're going to go ahead and open up our Bibles to Philippians 3. We're looking specifically at verses 12 to 16 today. But let's get a little recap on how we have gotten to this place. So according to Philippians 3, 8 to 11, which we talked about last week, we see that Paul has suffered the loss of everything to gain Christ, to be found in him, to know him, and in both his suffering and in his resurrection power. He wanted to know Christ more fully and had already put everything to the side for that. But in doing this, had he reached perfection? Absolutely not. But in this passage of Philippians 3, 12 to 16, Paul affirms his incompleteness in his journey following Jesus. So now that we have that idea, let, let's read this passage of scripture together and see what Paul is saying. Verse 12 starts and says, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect. I pressed on to make it my own because Christ Jesus had made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that to you also. Only let us hold true to what is being attained. This is the word of the Lord. So we have what Paul has taught in the past that is leading up to this, and he is giving up everything, admitting his imperfectness. And we're going to go ahead and dive into the scripture to see how Paul is pressing on to Jesus in that pursuit of Jesus. So read verse 12 again with me. It says, Not that I have already obtained this, or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus made me his own. Now Paul, a man who has done many wonderful and powerful things for the kingdom in so many different ways, begins off this section of verses by admitting and owning that he has not yet obtained this perfection, this resurrection with God. And we see the connection of making Christianity our own in that Christ has made us our own in this passage. So look at this, uh, this passage with me one more time. It says, not that I've already obtained this or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own. That is where we see the Christian making this Christian walk his own. And then at the end of the verse, he says, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. We have the ability to make this Christian walk, this Christian life we have our own because Christ has already claimed us and made us his own in that. And I love that Paul begins in the most humble manner he could. He comes about this saying, hey, I'm not perfect. I have fallen in many ways. And I'm willing to right here saying that I have not obtained this or I'm already perfect. Just letting you know. And we also continue to see that as Paul is stressing that he is not already perfect, he is showing us that as a Christian in this world, a fallen world for that, he is still involved in the struggles of this life in this world we have, and he still sins. In the full glory of the resurrection that we have with Jesus in the coming days remains to be in the future. 
So what we're going to do as we continue to look through this verse and the following verses, we're going to see how in this time we read, he says, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. We're going to see how Paul is pressing on towards Jesus, how he is looking towards Jesus to have that fulfillment in his life. Now in the verse at the beginning, it says, not that I've already obtained this. What is this, this? Well, at the beginning, I started with telling us how we got to this point. And this correlates with that perfectly, is that Paul was pursuing the knowledge of Christ, his sufferings, his resurrection power, in union with him at our final day. The this is his knowledge of Christ, his living for Christ. He is saying that if I am a man who has furthered and pushed the kingdom closer towards God, but I still have a long ways to go, and I'll get to know Christ more in this process. I get to know Jesus more in this. So slowly showing us that this entire theme of verses that he is pressing on towards Christ, this pursuit of Jesus. And in that verse right there, it says, but I press on to make it my own. That part right there, it says that there is a balance of faith and works of God's call in the believer's response. God calls us to be a follower of him, and the believer's response is to fully pursue that willingly and openly. The, press, the, the press on to Jesus comes from that us responding to the call of Jesus, accepting us as, as his own first. And Paul is using this verse as a statement to express that he has not yet received what he is longing for. For what he has been brought to that perfect completeness is not there yet, and that he so desperately aspires for that. He shows that he has not yet had it because he wants to have that perfect completeness in Christ, to be with Christ, to know Christ more, and to understand him more. But he's not there yet. But this also writing that Paul is giving us confirms that his understanding clearly that he, as a believer, has a continuous responsibility to pursue the purposes Jesus has chosen for him. And that spiritual progress and our continual spiritual walk and growing closer to God is vital for Christians to follow and pursue. What Paul is also showing us here is that this process of going towards Christ, to press on towards Jesus, is a long, long process. Now, no one said the Christian walk was going to be easy. I cannot read that anywhere in the Bible. But we have hope, for we know what is to come. And Paul is just telling us that he understands so clearly what the perfect completeness is going to be like with Jesus as he continues to strive and long for that, as that day is ever approaching. So we see that's how he is starting off the section of saying that he is not complete, pressing on to Jesus. And he continues that in verses 13 and 14. We can go ahead and read those together as well. It says, Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So once again, Paul is coming at this from a very humble standpoint, admitting that he has fallen short of continually following and longing and stretching out to God, of continually pressing on towards Jesus, fallen short. And Paul gives a beautiful example in this verse, in verse, uh, I think it's 14, no, sorry, in verse 13, of telling us what it means to leave our past of brokenness and anguish and hurt, but rather striving to a life with the Father. And that part says, Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straying forward to what lies ahead. Beautiful, beautiful craftsmanship here that Paul is doing to explain to the Philippians and where he is at in this process of him pursuing Christ more. And we also can read in this that Paul's life is purposeful, for he constantly aimed towards the heavenly goal that he has received by pressing on to Jesus. The heavenly goal that we have is a life with him and to know him more. And he is just showing, going full circle, that he is constantly aiming towards that goal. Never straying to the best that he can, as they know we are all human. 
And the prize of the fullness of the blessings and rewards is, is the age to come. So often, while we're here on this earth living uh, our life for Christ, we don't get to see the fruits of our labor, the fruits of pressing on to Jesus and what we have done. But it doesn't mean that fruits won't come of that. The prize we gain is when we see Jesus, when we get to be with Jesus. But he continues to let the Philippians know that he is continually aiming for that, even though he may not get to see what is happening at the moment with the fullness of the blessing. And right here we know that Paul's goal was the complete knowledge of Jesus. That is the goal. He's looking for a complete knowledge of Jesus, both in his power of the resurrection and in the fellowship of his sufferings. Paul wants to know every single little detail he can about Jesus so we continue to be more like him. We have been given this example to be like Jesus and to that we have to know him and Paul says he is constantly aiming for that goal. Now you may be asking in that verse, what is this goal then? Well, this goal as you read this part of the verse in verse 14 where it says, I press on toward the goal. You also can read that also refer to a finish line in a race. And this isn't the first time that we have imagery of the Christian life and running a race uh, put before us. We also can read in Hebrews 12 this same correlation. I'm going to go ahead and read those verses for us. Hebrews 12, 1 to 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that has been set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. In both of these verses, as we get that imagery of a race, we continue to see that imagery of the athlete in these verses. And just like a runner, who knows that a backwards glance at the ground that he has already covered will only slow him down. Paul also says that he forgets what is behind him and stretches out towards what is ahead, pressing on towards Christ. So he might complete the race and win the prize, which is Jesus. What Paul is using in these verses, while well, giving the analogy that we can get of the imagery of a runner running the race, what Paul is saying, I'm not going to look back to the things that I've done, both good and bad, but continually look forward to Jesus, reaching out for him, stretching out, longing for him to continue my life with him. So as we continue to see that, we look at the end of verse 14, and see the words prize and upward call. But what are these? So let's read that second half of verse 14. It says, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So the term call in Paul's letter, it possesses a rich significance that we can gain from that. So just here, get, get this imagery with me so you can make it click. Just as God called the Israelites in the Old Testament, Paul's letters show that God is calling people from all social and ethnic backgrounds into a fellowship with Jesus, into his kingdom by his grace. Just another beautiful example of how we can get, see how God is working in the Old Testament, see how God is working in the New Testament now, showing that even though we see there's such incredible change in this world, that our God is constant that his love for us has never changed, and that his wanting for us to have this relationship with him has not changed, just the method he has gone about it has shifted. So as we continue down, that being said from what we have learned from the Old Testament and the New Testament, the heavenly call that Paul is stretching for with all his might is God's call to be a part of a people to be a part of his people, of his beloved children. That's what Paul is really stretching for as he presses on towards Jesus. He's reaching for God. <clears throat> so when we can get that, so we have that identification with Christ. So that part of the people will stand justified on the final day. And that is the prize that we respond to that is laid before us, which is being justified before the eyes of the Father 
because of the response to the call that we believe and follow as we are a Christian. The end goal that we have, that we want to see the ultimate glorification of the Father. But when he looks at us at the final days, having Jesus walk over and go, I have covered him. We are justified in his eyes. And that's, that's what Paul, Paul is stretching for with such longing and anguish, pressing on towards Jesus in that manner to be justified in the end days. It's also important to note that Paul, when not focusing on what is behind, has never allowed his Jewish heritage, as we read in verses 5 and 7 of this chapter, nor his previous Christian attainments that we read in verses 9 up until now, obstruct his running of the race. No present achievement or past life could lull him into thinking he has already possessed all that Christ has desired for him. Once again, going back to the metaphor of not looking behind, but continually looking forward. Paul is not looking back of, I have this life and I've done great things, but it's all for the glory of Jesus. So I'm going to reach up, stretch for him, strive after him. Such an important things to know as he goes about this process. And you also can see the beauty in the writings of this uh, verse 14 in both the goal that we read being read as the running of the race and the prize as the glory that follows finishing. So the goal, we are running this race as believers of Jesus, running this race to him as fast as we can, striving yearning after him and all that he can give us and the prize we get is knowing him more loving him more and being known by him and being justified by him incredible beautiful things that paul is writing here continually showing us that in all of this that he is pressing on to jesus pressing on to knowing jesus more in any way that he can but this also continues to move us on to verses 15 and 16 You'll read those with me as well. It says, let those of us who think mat- those of us who are mature think this way. And if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that to you also. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. One thing to note about the language right here is that Paul has switched his wording. Verses 12 to 14, everything has been about I press on. It's been about I and me. And in those verses, you can see that he has switched over, talking about you and us, changing the mindset of how he is laying these verses out. And Paul is continuing to reiterate that we need to think towards the goal of Christ in that. So switching away from I am pursuing Jesus in this way to we need to do it in this way as well. Now, a word I want us to look at first over here in verse 15. It says, let, of us, let those of us who are mature... That word mature can be kind of skewed in a lot of different ways. So let's look at that real quick. So the word mature is the same adjective that translated as perfect in the original writing. So what essentially what Paul is saying, if you really are perfect or mature, you will realize that you are not yet perfect or mature. The same that he was stating at the very beginning of these verses in verse 12, saying that he has not yet obtained this, he has not yet obtained that perfect completeness, that spiritual maturity, he is reiterating that now to those as well, saying that you only know that you are not complete when you're willing to accept that, when you're willing to say that I am not perfect and complete, but if I press on towards Jesus, I can slowly, slowly begin to be more like him in any little way I can. So as you read this first part of verse 15 and see the word mature, we can read it as the idea of perfect and spiritual maturity, which is what Paul is going to head on a lot in this last little bit. This is important to understand because the concept of perfect spiritual maturity is the matter of refusing to focus on the spiritual accomplishments of the past and realizing how much effort is still needed for what lies ahead. Once again, that's what Paul is going back to saying, I do not look back to the things that I have done, but look as continuing at the Father as he did here in verse 13. Reiterating that more of having that perfect spiritual maturity is not holding on to the past, but looking towards Jesus for what is to come. 
And that is also where we get the explanation of the, the phrase, this way, that we're able to get in that verse, where it says, let those of us who are mature think this way. This way, Paul is repeating, is telling the people of Philippi to forget what is behind them and to look ahead where they have to go. Having that spiritual maturity lets you continue to move on towards Jesus, pressing on towards Jesus. And this also leads us to verse 16, which is Paul's only request that we have in the scripture right here. And that first part of the verse says, Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. And what he is saying here is that he asked the believers of Philippi should not turn back from the progress they have already made in living their lives worthy of the gospel. So, Make sure this gets across. Paul isn't saying, leave behind everything and continue to move on. No, the Lord has given us temptations and trials to build us up and make us closer to him, make us more mature and complete in him. So Paul is not saying, throw out this idea, say, you're building off that, but you're not solely leaning on that. You're realizing it's there, but you're not sitting there looking down going, I did that back there, I'm good, right? No, it's a... This happened, this has grown me, but I'm still pressing on towards Jesus. So, so great that he said that as his only command to the, the Philippians at the moment. And then as we read throughout the book of Philippians up until this point, God has begun a good work in them, undoubtedly. And that many of these qualities that the Lord has given them are evident. And that Paul wants, doesn't want the slight deviations from the truth that may be present to destroy the progress they made. He doesn't want them to think on the things that they have done and let them just sit on it and go, I've done enough. No, he wants you to realize that's there, but continue to press on to Jesus while you can. And that also, Paul is also saying that no one has to wait for God to reveal the truth on all points before he brings himself to spiritual growth. Paul recognizes that Christians, though on the same path of pursuing Jesus, are at different stages of spiritual maturity and that you should be faithful to as much of God's truth as they can understand. Paul is not saying this is a one-way thing to do it. No, he realizes that we are all at different stages in this walk that we have with Jesus. But the end goal is always the same. Just continually saying, press on to Jesus. Even in that time, whether or not you have a clear understanding of what's happening or he has not fully enlightened you to what is going on, press on to Jesus in that time either way. What Paul is also making sure to reiterate that only those who understand their lack of perfection, as you read here in Philippians, have begun to reach spiritual maturity. It's another reason why at the beginning of these verses he says, I have not yet obtained this. He has not yet obtained that perfect spiritual completeness. But you have to realize that we don't have that perfection. Only Christ has that perfection. And as our example, we are to press on to him. We have to realize that those of us who lack that perfection as we read are beginning to make the first steps to have the spiritual maturity that we are striving after. But this in of itself this walk with Jesus is a lifelong process. It's not done in a day. It'd be a lot easier if it's done in a day. <laughs> but Paul makes sure that to make his point known that how we press on to Jesus, how we go about this process. He wants to show us to leave the things behind and press to Jesus in all that we can. And even the times of trouble and the times where it feels like you can never get there, showing us that even in those moments, specifically those moments, that we're to lean on him more. And just like Iliad, that we talked about at the very beginning, the marathon runner, that we talked about having a large group of pace setters to help keep them on the right track, we too have the word and example of Jesus, as well as those the Lord has put around us. Having that spiritual community does nothing but boost us up. There's nothing but make our relationship with Jesus strong for we have those that are going about this life with us as well. And being surrounded by a strong group of Christians, or even just one, it makes all of the difference in the world. And your own personal goal of living a life that glorifies the Father 
having that community, being willing to go out and be vulnerable with others and together press on to Jesus in any way that we can. So my challenge to you is that well, you will use what God has placed before you and around you to press on to Jesus more. How can you take this time that we are in, take this time of complete and utter change and so many things that are drastically just kind of going crazy around the world. How can you use that to press on the Jesus more? How can you use that to rely on him more? How can you use that to realize that in our life of trying to get the spiritual maturity that we have a long way to go, but we have this beautiful example of Jesus to follow? Will you do that? Will you pursue him in that way? Press on to Jesus in any way that you can all the time and every time. Will you pray with me? Father, I want to thank you for this day. Father, again, I thank you for this time we've been able to have just to dive into your word and learn what it means to press on to Jesus more. Father, learn what it means, Father, just to grow in spiritual maturity, Father, for you and the glory of your kingdom. Father, I pray for those that are listening and watching. Father, that you will just do a good work in them. Father, that you will build them up for your kingdom. And Father, I thank you for the process and the building that you have already done in their lives and the lives of those around them. Father, in the lives that they have impacted as well. Father, again, we thank you for this time that we've been able to have the blessing just to have. And Father, we pray all these things in your son's precious holy name.